Hello, my name is Scott Schofield and I'm an Associate Professor in the Department of English and Cultural Studies at Huron University College, part of Western University. It's quite literally about five minutes from here. Um, my training is in uh, the Renaissance period, um, especially Shakespeare, uh, but it was in that capacity of training that I became very excited about rare books. Um, and today's talk comes out of some of that excitement. We'll be looking at a single book today, uh, which is part of a very large and rich collection here at Western. So today I'm going to talk about this book here, this very large, impressive, somewhat intimidating book, um, which is a copy of Andreas Vesalius's De Fabrica, uh, second edition published 1555. I'll be spending a fair bit of time talking about the book as object, so how it was created, um, the binding, uh, the text itself, the images, the illustrations, and so on. Um, but I'm, I'm going to start the talk with a little bit about Vesalius, why he was important um, before moving into those particulars. So Vesalius, and let's take a look inside because we have a picture of him. Vesalius, his date 1514 to 64, uh, was born in Brussels to a family with a history in medicine. Both his father and grandfather taught and or practiced uh, medicine. While well, studying in Louvain in the 1520s in Paris in the 1530s, Vesalius was introduced to the theories of the classical writer Galen. And it was from here that he took a greater interest in the study of anatomy. Following his graduation, he became chair of anatomy and surgery at the University of Padua. And throughout the late 1530s, he would publish a series of shorter publications, one of which included large illustrations for anatomy students. In 1542, he would contribute to a major multi-volume edition of Galen's work published in Florence. A year later is when Vesalius' most famous work was published, De Humani Corporis Fabrica, or On the Fabric of the Human Body, was first published in Basel by the talented printer publisher Johannes Operinus. It was dedicated to the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. This was an exciting time in the history of science. A year earlier, Leonard Fuchs published the most important herbal to date, a work that would include more than 500 illustrations, and including the first detailed descriptions of the potato, of tobacco, and more. 1543 also saw the publication of Copernicus's landmark study in astronomy, which translates to the revolution of the spheres. In it, he would pronounce a new heliocentric system where the sun rather than the earth stood at its center. So what made Vesalius' work so important? One thing is that it revised many long-held beliefs about the human body. As mentioned moments ago, it was Galen who served as a primary authority on Renaissance understandings of the human body. Vesalius had discovered that Galen had been using animals for dissection and thus many of his findings were incorrect. The result then was a revision of one of the most important classical sources at a moment when there was renewed interest in Galen and the study of Galenic manuscripts. Second, while it had been common for professors to have students carry out dissections, in fact, you'll see in some of the early 16th century texts images of a professor sort of standing on high, pointing down to a student who will then be doing the dissection. Um, Unlike that, Vesalius insisted on doing them himself. Whether working on bones or organs, his findings are based on first-hand observation. In fact, the opening portrait and title page, we've just seen the portrait, the very impressive and quite popular title page, um, <clears throat> highlights this fact. Both show him with his hand on the open body, and you can see here this uh, wild scene. I mean, now let's imagine instead of going to the movie theater, we all go to an anatomy theater and watch a live dissection take place. Um, here's what's happening here. We see Vesalius with the open cadaver looking out to us as uh, uh, of onlookers um, and those within the theater uh, look on as well. And the title page forms then a kind of still of the Renaissance anatomy theater. Spectators grappling for a view of the dissection in progress as Vesalius looks at us, the readers, who will dissect his work. So I want now to turn more closely to the book itself. 
I will discuss the printing, looking closely at how it would have been made. I will then focus more specifically on the illustrations, the brilliant woodcuts found from start to finish. I will then end on what are often referred to as copy-specific features, particularly the binding and the history of its ownership before it came to Western. First thing to mention is this is a second edition of Vesalius's work. The first, as mentioned, was published in 1543, and the second, which includes some corrections and additions, was made in 1555. I should add that a copy at the University of Toronto contains annotations in Vesalius's own hand, notes that were made towards a third edition that was never realized. One thing that unites the three works of science I mentioned, that is Fuchs' Herbal, Copernicus's work on astronomy, and Vesalius's book on anatomy, is size. They are long works published in a large format known as folio. Those of us with an interest in bibliography are especially concerned with how books are made. And one of the first questions we often ask is what is the format of the book? Large books like this, as mentioned, were made in folio. What that largely means is that you take a sheet like this, imagine a much bigger sheet, and you fold it once. Now, if you wanted to do a smaller format, you would fold it again. And we could keep going, right? My folds are not getting better. Oh, hold on, we're good, we're good. And one of the things you start to see, and this I'm moving towards an octavo, um, you can start to imagine this as a series of small pages. Right? Now, mentioned moments ago, the folio, however, is just like this. And then you do another one and another one. To give you a clearer sense of how that works, I want to take you inside the book for a moment. <clears throat> Well, we as readers tend to rely on pages, and, and the page as a unit uh, within books is, is not something that's been around forever. In fact, you, you really start to see it on the, on the rise in the 16th century, but it's not until the 17th, 18th century that it's sort of solidified. Um, where we have two, three, four, five, all the things we'd expect of a normal book. Printers, on the other hand, work through what are called signatures. And you can see here at the bottom of the page, on this little B, this little B. We go to the next page, or what we, to be technical, the next leaf, and this is B2. The next one, B3, B4. Now I know you're thinking out there, the next one's B5, right? Well, it's invisible. It is B5, you just have to believe me. The first four are what we call signed, the last two are not. B6, and once you get past six, you move on to C. So what this tells me is that we're dealing with a folio in sixes. And why that's important is it starts to give us a sense of how this book was being made in the print shop. That is, the various workers who are working for Operinus um, to put this together. When Renaissance printers produced books, they did so by hand, as mentioned, using metal type, which they arranged or composed in lines of type which were then locked into place. Rather than printing one page at a time, they would produce sheets which contained multiple pages, something I just mentioned in the demo. Once the sheets had been printed and they had dried, they could then be folded, cut, and sewn to form a codex or a book, which was then possibly bound. I say possibly because large books like this were almost always bound. Smaller formats, on the other hand, may be sold with simple st stab stitching. Um, we simply assume, again, uh, that, that, that binding was a normal thing, but it wasn't necessarily so. Now, I'm skipping a lot here in that printing process, but I think it gives some sense of the work required. I mean, take a typical page like this, page 5, you could page 55, 655, and what you're looking at is line for line, each of those lines having to be composed by a, what is known as a compositor, and then the second line, and so on and so on, and then all that type locked up. And again, you're not working with pages, but sheets. And again, you're starting to get a sense of the sheer labor that lies behind this book. 
you also will get a sense of the potential for error. Um, do this for 10 hours and see how good you do. When Vesalius decided to have his work printed in Basel, he did not simply send the manuscript to Operinus. He went there himself to help oversee the printing. This makes sense, for this is no typical production. Not only does the printing require a complex balance of image and word, but it also incorporates multiple languages. As was common in the early 16th century, the De Fabrica was in Latin, the language of European scholarship at the time. However, this work also includes Greek, and to a lesser degree, Hebrew. Well, the multilingual nature of the work reminds us of the audience being targeted. It also points to the demands on the print shop. You not only require individuals who can set the lines of type, but ideally someone who can proofread the copy for errors. In addition to being a printer, Operinus had also been a teacher of Latin and Greek. As a humanist printer, he was perfect for this kind of work. So let's look at a few pages to think through the sort of labor of putting this book together. I start here with page two. Early on, we get this typical set, and this is a typical page in many respects, with a couple of exceptions. You have your running title at the top, and we often, when we break down a page this way, we often refer to the, the layout of the page, or to use the French, the mise en page. So you have your, your running title at the top of the page, your, your narrative of text that is moving along here. You have these side notes, one of my favorite things of Renaissance books. We we're all about footnotes and endnotes. They were big proponents of the side note, which always makes sense to me, because it's right beside where you're reading. Um, but you'll also see here um, an image, an image of a bone here and a kind of cross section. And it's one of the first moments in the text where we see how this image text relationship works. One of the things you'll notice as you look closely here, and I'm going to bring out my magnifying glass for a moment, is that there are little initials, in this case, uppercase initials, all along the bone. And this is how the text works, because embedded within the text itself, and usually within these small side notes, are um, the, the sort of co corresponding text to those initials. This becomes really interesting when we move into the illustrations later on in the text. But I want you to also be aware of something else. This image here, unlike the, te unlike the type, which was, was metal, um, would have been cut into wood. Um, we know from evidence that Vesalius was using uh, woodcutters, artists, essentially, cutting into wood um, out of Venice. And at the time, they were some of the most accomplished in this particular art. One of the advantages of cutting into wood is you could literally put the wood wood or wood cut, if we're being uh, technical, in the actual form with the type. So the whole thing could be printed at once. But you're starting to see and imagine um, coming into the shop, being told you're going to set this type, but then we have to also place this image within or around the type. You're also working in large fonts like this, and beside it in small type italics like this, a point I made just moments ago do this for eight, 10 hours, and you start to see why people burn out in this profession. So this is page two. I want to look at also page 206, 207. Hear that sound? But your modern book doesn't sound like that. That's the sound of high quality paper. OK, I'll stop doing that, I promise. 206, seven. <clears throat> One of the reasons I've chosen this section is because I mentioned a moment ago, you can see here a mix of Hebrew and Greek with the Latin text. So once again, um, we use these terms typically today for, in other ways, but a printer would keep his type in an upper and lower case. And we still use that today to distinguish letter forms. In this particular case, you would not only need upper and lower, um, but you're going to need uh, specialized uh, fonts for for O's and E's with accents, for instance. And you're also going to need, in this case, Greek and Hebrew type. And so you can imagine this complex, almost I imagine, trays around um, the individuals composing. And as mentioned moments ago, you also need that skilled individual who can read uh, Greek and Latin. Having Operinus and Vesalius on hand comes in handy that way. Here's another great example of the kind of 
images and illustrations we see in Vesalius's work. Near the bottom, we get this cross section of an artery. And here too, as we just saw moments ago, there are both numbers and letters to indicate different parts, which then find their corresponding text um, in, in right next to it. Above it, in the top left here, um, is one of the many, uh, many woodcut initials <clears throat> that is, are peppered throughout the volume. And one of the things that's fun about these is that almost all of them have these little puti. They're almost like cherubs uh, who are per often performing their own anatomies um, within uh, the letter frame. Uh, sometimes you see them juggling skulls. So one, I, there's a pot where it looks like they're cooking skulls. And it's um, perhaps a reminder of the little bit of playfulness that exists in this otherwise serious work. <clears throat> Now, I've been talking a bit about these illustrations and as woodcuts, and I mentioned um, that they are done in soft wood, and they're usually the wood of fruit trees. We know that um, these particular ones, and I'll talk about this later, were done in pear wood. Um, but what's uh, particularly impressive is that um, often, and we'll get to the larger images momentarily, <clears throat> the first sort of instinct from those who study illustration is that we're sometimes looking at uh, copper plate engravings, uh, when in fact we're looking at woodcuts. In the 16th century, there's basically three ways to illustrate a book. One is using uh, wood. A second is using usually a metal like copper, um, and it's known as intaglio printing, in which, in which you uh, have to use a whole separate press, but leads to a, a more refined image. And the third is simply drawing, and it's not always simple. Um, if we think about the long sort of tradition uh, preceding print where all images were done by hand and illuminated in especially medieval manuscripts. Um, all of the, the woodcuts, as mentioned, were done in Venice and then brought uh, to Central Europe for the printing. So who lies behind the artwork? <clears throat> uh, most feel that it's likely the work of Jan Stefan of Calcar, a Flemish artist who studied under the famous Italian Renaissance artist Titian. Um, but whether Calcar is responsible for some or all, um, most agree that these all fall within what is known as the school of Titian. So let's look at what is arguably the most famous part of this volume, and that are the full page images of anatomical sections. Starting at page 210, we see the first of several, sometimes referred to as muscle men. Um, here you can see, uh, what, I, what I find powerful is just how unusual this is for displaying anatomy. Um, normally we would imagine sort of the body um, lifeless, laying on a table, broken into parts and so on, um, but this dead body, so to speak, is very much alive. We see it gesturing, we have this unusual kind of countryscape in the background, even obelisks. Um, but all the while, all of the parts, all of the muscles are marked and named, and we see the corresponding descriptions on what is known as the recto. So one of the advantages of this approach, that is the use of large illustrations like this, um, was that they were good for instruction. Um, students learning anatomy, imagine learning with live, um, or, or I should say, with physical cadavers, uh, but also these large images and text as a kind of um, textual um, uh, addition. Each of the muscles, as we've seen in other places, is marked by a series of upper and lower case letters that corresponds with the list on the right. For readers, this makes for easy movement between text and image. In fact, we might uh, pause for a moment and think about this as good uh, textual design. Um, we all know that a good website from a bad one, and part of that has to do with how it's, its layout, its aesthetics, but also its navigation. And what we're seeing here is an easy sort of proximate navigation between text and image. Rather than flipping pages, uh, we simply move across the gutter and back again, back and forth. But move ahead a few leaves. I'm just going to move for a second, and you'll see these wonderful images as we pass, and more gesture. Gesture again. 
here with the flaying skin. And again, and again, and I wanted to stop on this image. For here we're given a, a reminder of death as the body is now hanging from a noose. It was not uncommon to use executed individuals for anatomical dissection. What we have then is more than an artistic choice or a bit of dark humor. This is a cue to where at least some of the bodies that Vesalius and other anatomists uh, worked on came from. Well, one of the reasons I, I highlight the images, and it's a favorite of students, is, as I mentioned earlier, there is a kind of aesthetic disconnect. Um, they're absolutely fascinating, um, but they, in many ways, are not what we expect. And we can see this in other places, too. Let's go back a few pages uh, to one of my favorites, <clears throat> and that is the images of the skeletons. Here, um, in the section describing the bones of the body, uh, we get these two images side by side. And again, what's amazing is the gesturing for me. It's as if Hamlet here in skeleton form is reflecting on the larger state of human mortality. Um, here, the irony, of course, is a skeleton, a kind of death reflecting on death. But again, if you imagine uh, a modern anatomical textbook, we'd see nothing like this. Yes, the body perhaps in its full um, skeletal arrangement, uh, but not in this sort of way. One way of coming to grips with this for me is to think about the 16th century as a period where, yes, you have specialization. You might be a major in theology or in law, um, but you come through an educational system uh, which exposes you to a, a nice balance of the arts and, and, and sciences. So the study of geometry is paired with music, um, the study of um, grammar, rhetoric, um, and so on, um, is paired with maybe a, a specialized study in, in astronomy or something to that extent. So what I see when I look in these images is a, is a, a place before um, the division between the arts and the sciences, just as Vesalius is making that gesture forward to modern science. One more reminder of death comes um, as mentioned with, the, uh, with the, uh, the muscle man on the noose. But we also see <clears throat> reminders of life. Um, and here we see another example where the muscles here flailing to a certain degree, the weird cityscape in the background, and the figure still with its hair um, at the top. It's almost as if there's um, some attempt to keep some of the life form or things that we typically uh, think about as a, a living body um, as part of the image. Pages 755 to 758 give us a, a variation of this. And here we get into sections of the brain. And once again, it, for me it's about perspective. You know, there, remove the face there and this is a different image. Uh, but the face is a reminder of the living being um, that preceded the dissection. Here too, this powerful image where we can literally see the gesture of the human face just as the brain has been opened up for dissection. And as we move back to an earlier section of Vesalius, we get another full-length image here, this time of the veins and arteries in a, in a kind of rendition that could be pulled from a sci-fi film. Um, on page 200, we get an else, another unusual image, and that is of the instruments, there's our wonderful skeletons, um, of the instruments used in, in the uh, an, an anatomy theater. Uh, we have saws and knives and the things you might expect. But once again, this is another reminder of the many woodcuts that would have gone into this, and therefore the larger team of artists that are just part of the making of this beautiful book. Talked about the woodcut initials here. And we also get one more thing that's really exciting. And that comes, the first of which is on page 505. And these are foldouts. So you can see here, I love foldouts. So a breakdown of the body. Um, we know from evidence in the period that sometimes these would be cut out and put on the wall. You know, it's not quite the same as your favorite singer, but it's, uh, 
it's a, a, a reminder of this sort of, you know, almost like a large cheat sheet of the more complex work that's going on here. Um, I also think of these in terms of sort of a media design, and we think of, you know, uh, windows on our screens that enlarge when we want to zoom in on something. Um, these play that role too. There's almost a sense of Vesalius is saying, this book isn't big enough. I need this to be larger, and therefore we create the foldout. There's another foldout here, 553. Wonderful stuff. And, and once again, the initials marking the different parts, which have their corresponding descriptions here. Libri Corti Fini um, at the end of book four, a uh, reminder for the printer of where to put these in too. These would have been printed separately, um, not part of the usual sheet, uh, but probably as a, as a single sheet printing. And finally, uh, near the back of the book, page 825, uh, we get something we still have today in our books, and that's the index. And it starts here uh, with different letters marking um, the breaks A, B, C, D, and so on. But I show this in part two because it's a reminder, you know, well, it'd take a rather uh, studious reader to start up page one of Vesalius and read all the way through. Books of this kind typically uh, were used much like our own dictionaries and encyclopedia today. That is, you might go into one section, um, read it in some detail, skip ahead, move to another section, move back, and so on. It's not to suggest that there's, there weren't readers who read the whole. Uh, there definitely were. Um, but the vast majority would have been dipping in and out. And the index, again, which has its own long history, is one way um, to do that kind of navigation. I want to now move to what we often refer to as copy-specific features of a book. Um, these are what makes this particular copy different from the copy of Toronto, different from a copy in New York, a copy in Cambridge, a copy in Central Europe, um, and the many other copies, in this case, of Vesalius that survive. When we talk about Renaissance books, um, it's good to remind ourselves that each one is unique. Even if we don't think about the binding, which I'm about to talk about, um, just the printed text itself I mentioned earlier about the room for error as uh, type is arranged and so on. And it was quite common in the period for when errors were caught during the proofing stage um, to, to do what is known as a stop press correction. And that stop press correction would allow the printer to go in, reset the type, and proceed with the job. But often this was discovered well into the print run. And so if you print 150 copies of a sheet, let's say, um, you have two choices. You can dispose of them, which is a lot of money, or you can keep them, and they usually keep them. And so you get copies, um, some corrected, some not. And that's just one way uh, to think about the Renaissance book uh, as distinct from copy to copy. Another uh, starts with something like this, the binding. Um, if we were to look at all the surviving copies of Vesalius, first and second editions, we are bound to find others with a similar binding to this. But I'd be surprised if we found one that had the same binding. Um, partially because after the book was printed, um, it was often sold unbound, and it was up to the user to decide to have it bound or not. Sometimes this could be done in advance, so customized copies were done in certain ways. Um, and this copy may have been just one example. In 2018, <clears throat> this book came out, and it is a detailed census of all the surviving copies of the Fabrica, both first and second edition. Western's copy is in here. Uh, it has some wonderful descriptions, and one of the images, which I'll talk about momentarily, has been added. One of the things uh, you look for when discussing a copy is, when starting with the, the print, is do we have a complete copy? Is the title page present? Um, are all the foldouts there? Are there any missing leaves? In this particular case, Western's copy is complete. All the pages are present, foldouts, etc. The copy is bound in a near contemporary binding. Well, there's been some restoration. We can see, for instance, these pages here are later. And we refer to these as end papers. Um, these are later. 
Um, and some of this has been cleaned up at some point. Um, otherwise, it's original. The boards, and we refer to this as the upper board or top front board. Oh, it's like going to the gym. The lower board or, or, or bottom. Um, the boards are original, and so too is the spine. You can see this here. If you're getting really nerdy like I do often, uh, you'll get in here and you'll start to look at the bands too, and you'll see these sewing supports. Well, the sewing supports are important because they give us some sense of how the binding was made, um, but they can also speak to uh, cost. If this is a single band or a double band, for instance, that can be a clue um, to the expense that went into this book. But we often make a distinction when talking about bindings between the structural parts and the decorative parts. Now, this book here uh, was bound in what's known as blind-tooled alum tod German pigskin over wooden boards. Now, I know that's a big mouthful. I'll break it down a bit. Pigskin, obviously um, the animal it comes from. Books in the period were typically bound um, in, of calf, of sheep, of pig, um, and for high-end books usually of goat. Uh, but the Germans, uh, for the most part, especially with big books like this, uh, regularly relied on, on pigskin. Alum tod and tawing is simply a process. Um, and so this is done in a certain way uh, to give it the, the feel it has. And similar books in the period that are bound in vellum or parchment, and we still have vellum and parchment today, are also words that denote the process um, that brought that uh, book into form. When we turn to the upper board, and I don't know if you can see this well, but I imagine some of the photos in the video will bring this out, we have a, quite a, an advanced set of decorative designs going on here, a series of frames, if you will. And the basic unit of these frames are done uh, in fillets. That is, if we imagine this, this binding as soft and not, hasn't hardened yet, um, slow, shortly after the tawing stage, um, these designs are tooled into the binding. And when they are left this way, we refer to this as blind tooling. Now, if we were to fill this with something like gold, we would refer to it as gold tooling. So these fillets form frames. And within and between each frame, we get more advanced rolls, sometimes interspersed floral designs, these wonderful designs going up and down here. We have vases. We also have these wonderful almost medallion-like. It's as if coins were impressed into here. And following those medallions, we get short forms of names. Here's one of them, E-R-A-S, short for Erasmus, the famous Dutch humanist who's a contemporary of Vesalius. We move inward and inward, and then we get these wonderful panel stamps, four of which, each individual with a halo, likely a religious figure or saint, followed by a motto. So why does all this matter? Well, on the one hand, it's a reminder of the workmanship that goes into binding, just as the workmanship that goes into printing. Uh, but it can also be a clue uh, for us to figure out where it came from. We know, especially in Germany, that the records are particularly rich on binding. Um, and sometimes a particular stamp or an arrangement of medallions can point us not only to a particular region, but right down to a particular bindery. Um, who knows, maybe we could follow up on this at some point. Such decorative images were not uncommon in, in the period then. They do vary between binderies. Scholars have been able to show in some cases not only the region as just mentioned, but the specific binder behind the work. I would also add that binders will sometimes sneak their own initials on the board. I don't see evidence of it here, but that's particularly uh, nice when you find something like that. I see these all the time on books from this period. And they're usually um, exciting to some point, but they don't really take me very far. I have a number, I don't know when it was put on the binding, and so I hit a kind of dead end. Here though, we've got another clue, the great reveal. This. The original paste down uh, from the binding has this wonderful inscription 
in the top left corner. And it comes from one Johannes Bucerus. Johannes Bucerus, and it's dated, yes, 1574, 1574. Is this a coincidence? I don't think so. Did he buy the book in a bookshop already bound like this? Did he have it bound? That part I don't know. But the corresponding date here and here um, is quite helpful. As the census here will tell you, Western's copy was acquired by the Altdorf law professor Johannes Bucerus in Strasbourg in 1574. It's worth noting here the Latin argent, which is a shortened form um, for the Latin for Strasbourg. So we've got more here. Johannes Bucerus purchased in, or well, a resident in Strasbourg in 1574. But Bucerus was also born in Augsburg in 1548, and he died in 1610. Augustani here, which follows Bucerus, is a point to his birthplace. So if we fill this out again, Johannes Bucerus of Augsburg purchased well in Strasbourg in 1574. In those 62 years, Bucerus was very active, studying and teaching multiple subjects. Before he became a law professor in 1580, he was teaching in the Strasbourg Academy, and it was here he was acquainted with the medical faculty. This moment coincides with the acquiring of Western's copy. I would also add that at the top here is a line of Greek. Have mercy on us, Lord, as indeed we live and die. Have mercy on us, Lord, as we indeed, or as indeed we live and die. Was this Bucerus' motto? Quite possibly. We know individuals in the period, especially humanist scholars, often had their own motto. Or was this simply a creation for this particular copy? Hard to say. While it is difficult to know how much Bucerus read, and or used his copy, there is some evidence of annotation, and it may just be in his hand. As we look through the copy, periodically we see little bits of manuscript note in the margin, the first of which comes here on page 111. This black ink series of sort of condensed notes related to a passage center of the page. Jump ahead 600 pages to page 789 and we see another example of annotation. And this on a contested matter um, in Galen. Same hand, the passage is marked off. It's also worth looking at one last example, and that's on page 669. I've looked at this book many times, but I only discovered it on my last search. And what you find here is not so much annotation, but correction. You can see here in what looks like the same black ink attempts to correct errors in the text, here in the, in the Greek and here in the Latin text. Now, whether these coincide or correspond with, I should say, the errata, I'm not sure. But it's worth mentioning the errata for a moment. After that printing um, has taken place, and I talked about the proofing process, and periodically stopping to check each page, or in, in this case, a series of pages to form a sheet, um, continue on. But even, even with all of that work and, and periodic proofing, um, errors um, emerge and sometimes they're not caught until the very end. And so in books of this period you all often get what is known as the errata and that comes at the end of the book um, here after the first impression um, and it's a list of all the errors. Readers uh, would often start with that page and go through and correct in ink uh, the errors that were left in print. Um, what we saw on, on 669 may just be one of those examples but it may be beyond this. I would need to check it more carefully. Finally, um, there are a series of notes here on the back board. Fascinating. The back paste down um, in what appears at least to be close to the ink we just saw. It's hard to say. And what these are are accounts, or at least um, uh, attempts at 
understanding the final days of Vesalius and his death, narrative accounts of his death. And what's fascinating about this for me is I had mentioned about the difference between copies of Vesalius, but number of copies that survive um, have these, this account in the back. And so how do we explain that? It's hard to say, but this almost, almost um, sort of passing along knowledge perhaps between a cluster of, of individuals who were also writing this down uh, time and again. And we see this in other books of the period, for instance, uh, similar annotations and copies of Copernicus um, emerge, and this is a reminder of the networks that um, um, existed in Europe at the time. So we have an early um, bit of evidence on the ownership of this book from the 1570s. We have more copy-specific evidence in the form of the binding, um, that is, you know, that it is German, uh, alum Todd pigskin, and that it's designed in ways that are quite similar to other books of the period. But how does it get here to Western? <clears throat> well, that brings us to a later story. Dr. Lloyd Grenville Stevenson, his dates 1918 to 88, was a graduate of Western and also professor of Yale and then later director of the Institute of the History of Medicine at John Hopkins. He purchased the copy in 1949 for what the census notes to be 170 pounds. The census also mentions that copies of the second edition today typically sell in the six-figure region. I think it was a good investment. Both collectors, Bucerus and Grenfell Stevenson, are in some ways quite typical. As the census shows, I'll remind you of this, many of the collectors in the 16th century were scholars, professors, theologians, individuals with advanced academic training, advanced knowledge of languages such as Latin and Greek. I would add to this that then as now this was a collectible book and so it was also owned by high-ranking politicians. Indeed, some copies that survive have been hand-colored. So in addition to all the work we've seen in the printing, the woodcut illustrations, there is a final stage for those who have money as no object, and that is to have the whole thing colored by hand. And these were often in the houses of high-ranking dignitaries and so on. <clears throat> Put another way, if it is a book to be read and used, it is also not so bad to display. Stevenson is also a fairly typical modern collector. Well, the majority of copies of Vesalius today reside in university and national libraries and in museums. A number of copies are owned by those with a stake in medicine, including professors of the subject as well as surgeons. In fact, a number of copies are in the hands of practicing doctors. So I want to end with a final sort of footnote on the images, because uh, there's a remarkable story about them. Uh, so as early as the 18th century, some of the original blocks, that is the original woodcut blocks, had been discovered um, relating to these images here. But they're a kind of sort of found and lost and found and lost sort of story. Uh, but in the early 20th century, and of course it only makes it better, in the basement of an archive in Munich, um, a giant bag of the, of the blocks are rediscovered, so to speak. And these are the, the blocks that would have been used to do these original illustrations. Well, this was a remarkable find. Uh, for If we think about the history of science and the history of illustrated science, these particular images uh, were especially important. And it included even images that weren't used. So it gave us some sense of the larger sort of visual output uh, that was produced at that time. So this uh, was picked up by a historian in, in New York. And shortly thereafter, there was a, a kind of um, a decision reached between Munich and New York that they would uh, sort of create a modern Vesalius, especially of the images, and use the original blocks to do it. This was a major undertaking. So they were going to print with these original blocks. 
So they needed uh, a printer, uh, a modern printer who had expertise in uh, hand press, letter press printing, um, who was willing to do this. So it was done in Germany by, I think it's Bremer, B-R-E-M-E-R. -E <clears throat> so the work was done um, in a limited run, I think of about 600 copies. Um, it's a remarkable book. Um, I think as big, if not bigger, than Vesalius we have here. Sadly, though, um, this was taking place in the 1930s. Um, what happens uh, uh, the next decade? Well, World War II. The bombings in Munich, as elsewhere in the world, uh, led to the destruction of the blocks. So the blocks no longer survive. However, because of that printing merger, um, we do have a kind of a, a record of them. And it's, and it's, yes, we have the original images here, but we also have those images plus the ones that weren't included um, from this sort of early 20th century endeavor. And I end with that in some ways because it's a reminder in some ways of, of the ways in which we preserve. You know, it's not only taking care of books like this, um, but it's also making sure they reach a larger public. And I hope this is partially what's going to come about from today. Now, whenever I teach any class in literature, whether it's a first year class, an up year, year class that has a strong element of book history, I make sure to bring students to special collections at Western to see the wonderful things that are here. And every single time I bring out this book, and every single time it is one of the favorites in the class. We stop and look at a skeleton like this, and while I try to move on after the 17th question, I realize it's time to go. And so we return again, of course, for a second visit and look at more of Vesalius. Now, I started this talk by mentioning how this is but one of the many uh, books in this incredible collection here at Western. I want to end by pointing to another book, just recently acquired, the newest book in the History of Medicine collection, Minder's Anatomical Mannequin of the Human Body, published in the early 20th century. I end with it because when you open, you can see here that the body is available for a kind of virtual dissection. You start with the uh, mannequin here, and little by little we dig into the body all the way through, much in the way uh, that you might in a children's pop-up book. But while we may be thinking we're looking at something that is new, that is part of the 20th century, the technique itself actually dates back to the mid-16th century. In one of the books that was often sold along with De Fabrica came a series of which are known as fugitive sheets, where owners would reassemble the body and create their own virtual dissection. In this sense, then, the 1910 book very much connects to the book of 1555. It's been great uh, returning to this copy of Andreas Vesalius's De Fabrica once again. I'm especially grateful to Western Archives and Special Collections for allowing me to come in to work on this, uh, especially at this challenging time. Thank you so much, and take care.